Hello everyone, today's vlog is all about residency. So why is residency so important in the tax world? Well, basically it drives where you pay tax, which jurisdiction will you pay tax to, which tax authority in which country, all hinges around residency. So um, it applies both for corporations, for companies and for individuals. So touching on the companies first. So a company will be subject to UK corporation tax if it was either incorporated in the UK or it is what is known as centrally managed and controlled from the UK. So that's the two criteria that you will pay corporation tax. So the first one is, is the most straightforward. If you set up a limited company in the UK, um, doesn't matter if you run it from overseas, the fact that it's um, incorporated in the UK, it will pay UK corporation tax. So the next one, centrally managed and controlled from the UK. So this has uh, given rise to lots of interpretation over the decades, been a lot of cases in the courts. So assuming, um, let's say you have a business that is incorporated in South Africa. But the board of directors, they meet in the UK and it's ran from the UK. All the central management decision-making function occurs in the UK, even though the company itself has been set up overseas, in this case, South Africa, it will still pay UK corporation tax because it's is centrally managed and controlled from here. So what companies tend to do from a tax planning point of view, if they don't want to fall under the UK tax net for corporation tax, is engineer so that the company is not centrally managed and controlled from the UK, if in that scenario it's established overseas. Now the most um, common example of this is in Ireland. So Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, has a corporation tax rate of just 12.5%, quite a bit lower than ours in the UK. UK is still very favourable compared to all the other G7 and G20 countries. 19% is pretty low, but in Ireland, 12.5% is considerably lower. So a lot of companies with UK individuals in charge of them would want to seek and have Irish residency so that they're paying 12.5% corporation tax instead of 19% UK tax. And how they go about it is setting up the company in the Republic of Ireland, but also having the board meetings and making sure that all the primary decisions are taken in the Republic of Ireland. A lot of directors will just fly over to Dublin every quarter, have board meetings or every month uh, and do it that way. It's perfectly within the rules to do that. You've just got to make sure that you don't fall foul of those rules. Over the decades, there's been countless examples of the courts where HMRC have tried to say, look, central control really resided in the UK. You didn't really make any decisions overseas. And some of the decisions in court have gone HMRC's way. Some of them have gone with the taxpayer. So you really need to think and plan carefully if you're in the scenario of wanting, for example, to set up a company in the Republic of Ireland, but you yourself live in the UK. So how do you get around the central management and control? Can you do it um, properly and make all the decisions overseas? It is possible. It's not practically the most easiest thing to do, but a lot of companies do it. So consider um, the corporate residency of where you want your business to be. If you are a UK individual, can you have a corporate situation where your business is established overseas. Turning now to individual residency. So from an individual point of view, we're concerned with income tax, not corporation tax. And for many years, there was no statutory footing in the UK. There was loose HMRC interpretation of what it meant to be a resident. And most people took it that it was a day counting exercise. And so long as you spent so many days out of the UK as an individual, then you broke UK residency, which meant you wouldn't pay UK income tax. And 
people assumed that for many, many years until it was tested about 15 years ago in the courts. There was an airline pilot who was based in the Seychelles and he didn't spend much time in the UK at all. He was always flying around the world, spent a lot of time in the Seychelles. However, he was still a member of UK golf clubs. He had his kids at private school in the UK and he had these ties and connection factors to the UK. And when he was challenged by HMRC, who said, actually, we, the UK tax authorities, want to tax some of your income in the UK. He said, well, I'm not a UK resident. They took him to court and he lost. HMRC won, principally because of, even though he spent so many days outside the UK, he had all these ties to the UK. So there was a bit of uproar um, in the profession generally saying, look, we need clarity on this. Um, because for decades we thought it worked one way, now it's been shown in court that actually it's something else that we didn't think applied. This this loose um, sort of guidance that HMRC had wasn't watertight. We need something in concrete, in law, that says this is how it should be. So that is when, a few years ago now, they introduced what's called a statutory residency test for individuals. And this is a combination of day counting and also connection factors. And it's quite prescriptive because it needed to be prescriptive because it was too vague before. So in other words, you start with counting how many days in a particular tax year you spend in the UK. And if you spend a certain number of days that is deemed to be quite a lot of days, then you look at connection factors. And if you have one or two connection factors that connect you with the UK, then the end result could be that you're not UK residents. The more connection factors you have to the UK, the less likely you are to break the residency. So if you have more days away, then you need fewer connection factors to break residency. But if you've got more days in the UK, then obviously you, you need the, the fewer ties to the UK. So you need a combination of both. And it's a pretty complicated flow job, but thankfully it's on the statutory books. You can follow it through or get an accountant to, to help you with it and determine whether or not you are a resident or not. Because if you are, then potentially income tax applies. And if you're not, then you escape the UK tax net done on a year-by-year -year basis. It's not as if you are non-resident for one year and that applies for the rest of your life because circumstances change and you have to keep testing it year on year. So if you are thinking of moving abroad for whatever reason, if you're emigrating or getting a job or working overseas for several years, you need to think through, look through this statutory residency test to see if you will indeed break residency. Because the worst thing that could happen is if you move overseas and you haven't actually broken the UK residency, which means that potentially you're going to be taxed twice on the same income. Your overseas earnings, the UK tax authorities will want a slice of that because you haven't broken UK residency. But as far as the jurisdiction is concerned where you're now residing, you're a resident of there and they all want to tax you. So two separate countries, both treating you as residents of, the, of their own country, tax twice on the same income. Now, if you are in that situation, thankfully, that's when uh, the so-called tiebreaker clause of the double tax treaty comes in. The UK has double tax treaties with um, nearly 200 um, countries across the world, nearly all of the countries. And that says, that sets out the reasons and the rationale who would actually have first dibs on the tax. So it could be that even though the UK effectively says you are resident here because you are residing abroad you'd pay the tax overseas and then any UK tax would just be a top-up to whatever the difference is between the overseas tax rate and the UK tax rate so you're not effectively paying tax twice it's just it still can be disadvantageous of course if you move to a low tax jurisdiction if you're moving to the Caribbean or the Middle East where the rate of income tax is zero um, and the UK tax authorities want to tax you as well. Yes, the double tax treaty kicks in and says, well, we'll just look at the, the higher of each. Well, the higher of 40% and nil is still 40%. So it could be a bit of a shock if you're cash flowed and budgeted for living in the, the Middle East, say, with the increased rents and everything else, the lifestyle that goes with it. 
but you're still having to pay 40% tax in the UK because you never broke residency, because you didn't think through the statutory residency test enough. And it could be something as simple as just staying away for a few more days or delaying your departure until the start of the next tax year. Let's say you go away in February, but say, well, hang on, maybe just delay it six weeks till the 6th of April, things like that. So any sort of departure abroad for work-related purposes, do consider this SRT, statutory residency test, and don't fall foul of it because it could be very expensive if you do. So that was a quick overview on residency for both corporates and individuals. If you like this video, please do subscribe and I will see you soon.